Sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerinde iş dünyası için fırsatlar konusunda konuşacağız şimdi ve konuşmalarını yapmak üzere bir diğer konuk konuşmacımızı sahneye davet etmek istiyorum. Sürdürülebilir iş alanında küresel düşünce lideri, ödüllü yazar, yönetim kurulu üyesi ve başkanı Sayın Marga Hoek bizlerle birlikte alkışlar eşliğinde sahneye gelecek. <gülüyor> Some call me nature. Others call me mother nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me, one way or the other. Your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? Yes, a little while ago, I was talking to this historian and I had to think about him when I saw this video again. He told me, imagine you have a timeline in your head. Maybe you can join me doing that. And on that timeline, the largest line is the time the world is actually exist, and you heard it in the video, over four and a half billion years. <laughs> Imagine a line of four and a half billion years. Then, on that line, only 200,000 years ago, and you can imagine it's just a tiny spot in the timeline, that's the time that humankind entered into that world. <laughs> Four and a half billion, and then 200,000 years, tiny end. Of that 200,000 years that we walk around the globe, only 200 years ago, we started with our industrial revolutions, which brought a lot of progress, but on the downside caused the problems the world is facing now. So it's only a tiny moment in history, isn't it? And Jeffrey just talked about the pandemic, so I don't have to do that a lot today. But didn't it ever show us, in terms of sustainability, that if we are forced to not act, to shut down our factories, to not travel, to clear up our cities, well, stay at home even, that the world that has existed for a half billion years actually recuperated very, very quickly. 
I mean, take for example the rivers in India. People have tried for decades to clean that river up because it's so dangerous for people. All the waste is dumped in there, but people drink from it. And, and we didn't achieve much. But when we were shut down, in a few months, the, those rivers cleared up 50 to 60 percent. Now, my message is not that we as humans should be forced to inaction. No, my message is that if we put our minds to it and we act, we can change the world for the better in very little time. So it's worthwhile to put your heart and your mind to it because you can have huge impact in little time. And that is precisely what we need. I'm not going to talk about politics. I mean, you had Jeffrey covering that. I'm talking business. I'm a business person myself. I've led several companies in the construction sector, SME, but also a listed company. And I learned from experience, when you have a mindset to turn things around and be the best entrepreneurial self you can be, you can achieve good business, but also tremendous positive impact on the world. And boy, does business have power. I mean, yes, politics are important and, and we need them. And we need NGOs and all organizations. Business absolutely cannot do things alone. But on the other hand, business has huge influence. Did you know, for instance, that the 100 largest economies in the world are actually, 69 of them are corporations and not countries? 69 of the large economies in the world by revenue our corporations, our companies. So that comes with a high amount of responsibility. And more and more business is taking on that responsibility. And let me jump to 2015. Unfortunately, we just uh, heard again <laughs> that uh, Turkey was late in rectifying the climate agreement, but I can assure you, you were there with the sustainable development goals. You were in the first cohort of countries to embrace the SDGs and also voluntarily measure the country against those goals, which is equally important. But in 2015, 193 countries signed off on these SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and we can refer to them as the moral compass for the world or a blueprint for business or whatever you want. They succeeded the Millennial Goals. It was not that we didn't have goals before. But what was very different was that whilst forming these goals, business was an active player, much more so than in the past. Why was that? Because business leaders, at least a part of them in 2015, were aware that there's no business in a collapsing world. So it's in the best interest of business itself to make sure we maintain a sustainable world and we do everything we can to recuperate things and to get to a point where the world and its people literally can sustain. So in that sense, these 17 goals you could see as the new definition of sustainability because every challenge we have from poverty to climate change to consumption and production, life on land, life underwater, etc., is in there. But it comes with a deadline, ladies and gentlemen, of 2030. And since we started in 2015, we're halfway through time. We're not halfway through achievements. We are way behind of achieving them. So we need to do things faster, at larger scale, and more radical. But there's ways we can do it. So let's have a look at that. From 2015 onwards, when we had these goals, like I mentioned, countries and later on companies started to measure themselves against those goals. And many countries in the European world and the OECD countries thought in the beginning, oh, we're good, you know. Um, back then, the slogan was sustainability is becoming mainstream, which is, of course, absolute nonsense. 
because we haven't even really started to scale yet. But once the measurements was there, reality set in. We saw that there's a lot of work to be done. And this is an image of the OECD countries. I'm not asking you to read all the lines or to read all the countries. It's just the overall impression I want to share with you, that there's a lot of yellow and still a lot of red on climate change, on inequality. And those are the OECD countries. When we look, for instance, at Sub-Sahara Africa, it's a different ballgame. I mean, one thing that stood out for me, what Jeffrey just said, is that we cease to comprehend we have a global responsibility. Often when people look at these charts, they say, oh, my country is actually doing really good. You're in the, in the mid sector, by the way. But it's not about where your country is. It's about where the world is. And most companies nowadays, even if they're SMEs or small startups, have international supply chains, collaborate internationally, and with that comes along the responsibility of every place you touch with your company if we look at it from a business perspective. So again, it's in the best interest, progress around the globe, and not only here at home. So a lot of work to be done in other regions of the world. I wanted to show you briefly, of course, you know, ESG. It's not a very different thing than the sustainable development goals. I often get that question because you can kind of group the sustainable development goals for the E, the S and the G. Let me briefly explain. The E probably, you know, is about resources, about pollution, use of resources, about deforestation, about biodiversity. So all the tangible ecological things. Those of ESG are kind of the easiest things to materialize, need progress very urgently. The S, the social components, it's about health, health and safety in working environments, it's about impact on communities, it's about beating hunger, about education, all the social components. The G is important to understand that in a way it's a hygiene factor and a condition, a condition for the rest. It's about bribery, corruption, um, payment of top executives, diversity in the boardroom, etc. Often companies think, oh, well, that's, that's less important, or I'm a mid-sized company, it's less relevant. But imagine you do great on E or S, and you have great achievements, but then you are attacked in cybercrime and you didn't protect you it well, or you have a tax issue, then all the work is done for nothing because your reputation will be damaged hugely. So they're equally important, and the G is actually in condition. So let's go back to the state of the world and where we are with the SDGs. How were front-running companies thinking then, and CEOs leading companies thinking about the challenges we actually have and we want to reach by 2030? Well, the first thought is doing less bad is not good enough. Of course, incremental energy efficiency programs, for instance, that take small steps but at large scale, are valuable because they make a dif difference short term. But in general, to come to a zero point and even beyond is much more important than doing small things. So it's a radical shift of companies we mean and even thinking about again, what is actually the purpose of a company knowing this? So in some business coalitions and groups we discuss this and we came up with actually quite a radical view. And that is that business can and should be a force for good, having a net positive impact on ESG or SDGs. Let me give you a couple of examples. Think about, for instance, and you see that in the image here, the plastic in the sea. We all know that the plastic soup by now has the size of, for instance, France and Germany together. But still, 60 million tons are dumped into the sea of plastic. 
we only recycle 8.5% of all plastics. So we're not doing so well. And if we don't radically change that behavior by 2050, for instance, in the sea, we will have more plastic than fish, which has dramatic consequences. So imagine if we talk about circular economy, and if we talk about circularity of plastics, wasting less into that ocean is not good enough. Even wasting zero still doesn't solve the problem of all the plastic that is already there. It has to be taken out. Hence the idea of Brian Slutz with his ocean cleanup to literally clean up the oceans and the rivers for that matter, because everything from the river ends up in the ocean, of course. So we have to solve it. Think about carbon. Yes, we have to go to zero because we have to stop emitting uh, carbon. And Jeffrey was mentioning uh, the deadlines from that regard. But imagine, even if we don't cause any additional carbon, we have to still delete, absorb, millions and trillions of tons of carbon that are already there. If we don't take that away, we still won't meet the climate agreement, even if we don't cause additional carbon anymore. So, the way of thinking from companies should be, we want to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. And to be a part of the solution, you have to move towards a positive impact. Now, this comes with a huge opportunity. Not only is there a huge threat, but it represents a great opportunity at the same time. Because, as we have investigated with the Global Business Commission, we did a lot of research on that, because of the fact that business is so impactful and important, and because of the fact that so many things have to be solved, huge new markets open up. And we calculated it to be representing $12 trillion dollars until 2030, for sure, and 380 million new jobs. So that's a huge opportunity. And feel free, as business, to think like that, because you're an entrepreneur, leading a company, or having a role in a company, and business is about seizing opportunities. And it should be, if it wants to be successful. So huge opportunities. And you can like spot where these opportunities are, of course. And predominantly, you see the biggest opportunities in areas where a lot of solutions are needed. So, for instance, in food and agriculture, we waste 750 billion dollars a year on food waste. Turn it around, come with solutions to prevent or to mitigate food waste is a good business case. We need to produce more food, we need to improve agriculture and prevent loss of harvests, etc. Cities is a domain where a lot of business solutions and business opportunities lie in sustainable housing, in sustainable mobility, infrastructure, preventing water loss in cities, and so forth, and so forth. Energy materials speaks for itself. Circular economy opportunities alone represent 4.5 billion of business opportunities. And health and well-being, ladies and gentlemen, by now, more people die of obesitas than lack of access to food. So solving that problem in creating more healthy food, in helping people to monitor health, in digital health solutions, dietary, exercise, all those areas are business hotspots, so to say. And these add up altogether to $12 trillion. Now, you're all from industry and manufacturing. You actually make stuff, cars, electronics, agriculture, you make all kinds of things. And those hotspots are very, very relevant to manufacturing sectors specifically the circular model. So think, when you leave this room today, what opportunities are there for me? How can I engage with these SDGs, and how can I engage with these new markets? 
I'll go through a couple of examples how other companies did this, and not to give an ideal picture that they are perfect and you are not, for instance, but because we can always learn lessons from how others went about things. DSM is a Dutch company. It's based in the south of the Netherlands, where I live. And it was originally a coal mine. Well, not very sustainable. Then it transformed into a bulk chemical company. Not very sustainable either. And then its CEO, who has, resigned, who has moved on his career recently, Veike Seibersma, thought, we have to do this th differently. I don't see a future in something that's actually damaging the planet. I want to do something good with this company, and how can we do that? And one lesson we can learn from, for instance, this company, it's not always that you proceed with the same products or services you used to do, but sometimes it's about the competencies that lie behind them. And in case of DSM, there was only one thing that was their core competence, which they used moving forward, and that was science. They were extremely good at science in chemistry. And they actually used that to become a purpose-driven company about scientific-based, sustainable solutions for materials, resources, energy, and nutrition. And they did it in a way that was convincing to investors, which is an important thing, because we have seen some sustainable CEOs leaving by activist shareholders in the past. But he proved that this strategy was purpose-driven, but performance-led, and that the company actually demonstrated higher growth rates and more profitability as a result. And by making that so clear, he had an impact much larger than only his own company, because it helped many others, of course. Another example is a French company. And that is inspiring because, you know, when we talk about sustainable housing and, and all the labels that go around, it's always about reducing it to zero. But this company said, actually, that's not what you should aim for. You should want to be on the positive side of things. So they developed and built positive energy, positive houses and apartment buildings. And it was a more profitable business case than had they not had such a high ambition. But not only that, it became a proposition to create affordable houses for people that were risk-free. Because imagine, if you don't have a, an energy bill, the, the rising gas prices can't hurt you. You have a productible amount of costs in your living, and more affordable. And they're really successful in it, and scaling it up now. Another example is the company Orsted. They were recently, in last year, awarded with the most sustainable company in the world by Corporate Knights. The first thing they did, and they were an oil and gas company, say, okay, we want to switch and we'll concentrate on wind energy because it's large scale, it matches our competencies, we should be able to do that well. And because they set such a bold ambition and such a clear ambition, guess what? They reached it earlier on. And that's what we see with companies that have a bold and clear ambition. They reach it earlier on because everybody knows where to go, what to do, and that their ideas are being embraced. The next stage, what they have to do, and this is much harder, and they're on that journey now, is to say, OK, but now we want our whole supply chain. And imagine the windmills have to be made, had to be brought by sea, by ships, have to be repaired, etc., etc., etc. It's a huge supply chain. We want that supply chain completely decarbonized as well. We set up a network for it. We give time to suppliers, but when they don't succeed and they don't do it, we change suppliers. Clear, strong leadership. And that's what brings progress. Company here in Turkey, Arcelik Group, in um, household appliances. Companies that deliver to consumers, like Arcelik or Ikea or, you know, many brands, they have huge impact. 
because not only can they make their own company sustainable, their production side, their total supply chain, but more so they can inspire all consumers at home with their messaging and how to bring it about and have impact on millions of consumers. Arcelic is a really good example of a company on that journey. They reached uh, carbon zero for the production plants in 2019. And they did it, and this is really important, scientifically based and were acknowledged by doing it that way. Facts matter because you always have to report in the future and have to share the insights. So huge amount of examples of companies who think let's aim beyond the horizon to become a positive impact company and be a company that really gives action to business as a force for good. Jeffrey mentioned technology earlier in his uh, keynote. You know, we are now just over the threshold of the fourth industrial revolution. And this is an exciting period where digital and digital t technologies blend and come together. It's the biggest accelerator to become sustainable and do that with new business models and more impact than we ever had. I'm currently writing a new book on technology for good because it's so exciting what we can do. We can print coral to make up for lost time. We can have throughout this pandemic robots clean hospitals because they cannot be infected. We have artificial intelligence, we have blockchain to track things, so many technologies. But still, I see many companies think, oh, that's tech, that's the tech sector. No. All these technologies apply to every single company, no matter the size, no matter the sector. You can always use them to improve your sustainability, but also your profitability. So now we see more and more companies really using that. And let me give you a few examples on how they do that. Prosolva is a German technology. Now you can imagine if you are an SME-sized company and you're in the business of constructing facades, fronts for buildings, that's a highly competitive market. And that's a market with a very low margin. I've been in it myself, three, five percent max, something goes wrong, you lose it. But by transforming France in something completely new, in this case, literally smoke eating France by some chemical new material, part of the fourth industrial revolution, these new materials can absorb the smoke from the air, neutralize it. So there's a new value creation, not only in the front, but a new function that adds huge value and that lifts a company like that out of a competitive, uh, uh, price competitive situation. You can use fronts like this for hospitals, parking garages, alongside roads, etc., etc. It's a new kind of way of making things. If you make something, make sure it has a sustainable function. Cross Textiles is a Turkish company who is very progressive in enhancing the circular economy in textile sector, which is, of course, very, very important. And they use blockchain, as do many other textile companies by now, to locate columns and the journey that the materials are going and fact-checking using blockchain to do that, which wasn't possible before. So it really helps them. And my last example is Nafham, is an Egypt company. And they have made school digital. They don't compete with schools, but they make education accept accessible for many who are not able to go to a physical school to get education. And it's growing really, really fast. And by now, millions of students can use it. And so they boost education in areas like Syria and Egypt where it wouldn't be possible otherwise. So we've talked about aiming for positive impact. We talked about using technology to have even greater impact and to progress and to scale solutions. 
Let's not forget the importance of the new generation. Probably most of you recognize this picture of Greta Thunberg. She's always very angry, but she's on every stage in the world. By now, she's not alone. She's not the only new generation, millennial generation, Z person who says, well, listen, I didn't cause this climate crisis. It was dumped on me. I want it solved. I want a future for me and for next generations. And it can be solved. Greta, for instance, points out time and time again that we invest $5.9 trillion a year in subsidizing fossil energy. Subsidizing. You know, that can be true. I mean, geopolitics and complex politi politics situations, these things have to stop quickly. But not only are they actionists for what they don't want or what they want to achieve, there are also generations that literally vote with their wallets. And that means that if you have a sustainable product or service and it's recognizable as such, which is also important, your chances are to tap in this hugely growing market. I mean, millennials and Z are more willing to pay more for sustainable products. They demand sustainable products and services and they want to work for a purpose-driven company. Eight out of ten of those new generations says it's one of the key things when I consider a new job. So on the positive side, you know, if you're ahead of the curve, you'll be adapted beforehand to this new market. When you don't, you lose considerable market size. They spur the development hugely. Now, to round up, let's think a little bit about the leadership that is needed for this. Because leadership, ladies and gentlemen, is key. And we can't wait for politics. And we shouldn't wait for politics. We should drive change with our business. Because that's what we can influence, as well as the ecosystem around it. Now, these examples I showed you of companies that are doing things relatively well, demonstrate that, for instance, intentional is key. That means that as a leader, you have to put the SDGs of sustainability at the heart of your strategy. So not saying, oh, I have a couple of nice examples and a couple of nice cases, the rest will go on as it was. No, it has to be a driver for the key strategy of your company. And that sounds easier than it is, I can tell you. Secondly, we need bold leaders. Leaders that are willing to set objectives and ambitions at a hive and at a timeline that they're not really sure if they can achieve it and definitely don't know how to achieve it. But that's what it takes. All the examples I showed you were leaders like that. When you would have talked to them at their home and asked them how they have felt, they said, I was really insecure. But I knew that if I really wanted to achieve something, this is what I needed to do. And so they did. So ambition is good. Bold objectives is what we need. You have to be consistent. You can't today say, oh, we're going to go on this sustainable journey with the company and I go on driving in my uh, polluting diesel car or any other comparison. You have to walk the talk every day, in every situation. Then you'll inspire everybody and people will believe you and follow you. And last but not least, you have to be accountable. And that means what you do and what you say has to be objectified, has to be materialized. You have to measure it and you have to disseminate the information and share it. And if you do that well, it works for you because ESG or SDG reporting is not something negative. It's an opportunity, if you progress, to share with stakeholders, clients, investors, your impact and what you've done and what you've achieved. If you want to read or think about more or read more about the cases, 
This is my book, The Trillion Dollar Shift, which I wrote together with the Business Commission, Paul Polman, um, Fikers Abismai, and many others, with all kinds of business opportunities. And I would like to repeat to you, you're a business. It's okay to have a business model, but you can and you should combine it with being a force for good. Because business is powerful in this world. And that comes with a huge responsibility and an opportunity. And many companies together can achieve great things and fast. And last but not least, there simply cannot be a plan B. So waiting or delaying is not an option because there's no plan at B. Thank you very much.